Good morning. I want to greet each one in Christ's name this morning. Turn with me to Ephesians. A few weeks ago, I ended my uh, book study on Daniel. So I decided the next one to do here in the New Testament. And I will um, do it to my best ability. I will say that some, obviously some studies with our personalities and interests, some studies will be easier than others. This one's going to be a little more difficult, I believe, for me. But at the same time, I'm hoping that I can find things in here that will be edifying and help each one of us to grow. Unlike a number of books in the Bible that we don't exactly know who wrote them, we can have good guesses. Um, Ephesians actually tells us who wrote it. Ephesians 1, we're going to read the first two verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from our God, from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So why was Paul writing to the Ephesians here? Um, We're going to look next um, in Acts chapter 19. Don't have to turn there yet, but when um, Paul was on his, what I believe was his second missionary journey, I read somewhere yesterday as I was studying also that someone called it his third missionary journey, but it doesn't matter. Um, in Acts chapter 19, we'll see that story. But I just before I get to that, I do want to talk just a bit about Paul. Who was he? Most of us probably have an idea. There's probably a story in the Bible that sticks out to us when we think of the Apostle Paul. There's, um, he's probably outside of you know, outside of or the Moses, we have a lot of stories about Moses. Obviously, Jesus, the center of what the Bible is about, we have a lot about. But outside of those, I think we probably, the next to that is the, we have the most written about Paul. But he was born in the town of Tarsus, and I looked it up, and Today, if you look on Google Maps, it is still called Tarsus. Sometimes they spell it a little different or pronounce it differently, I think. But just out of interest, I looked to see how far it is away from where these earthquakes hit a week ago tonight. And um, it's about 75 to 100 miles west of where those earthquakes hit was where Paul was born and raised. At about age 13, he went and studied under a famous rabbi named Gamaliel, if I'm saying that right. And Paul was on a path to go far in the Jewish religious system. Some people even say that he may have been a a Sadducee, and within those, not sure. But when we think about Paul and the work he would go on to do for the church and all his writings. I had to think, you know, sometimes I think about Paul and I think, wow, he made a, a, at the road, on the, the event on the road to Damascus, he made a 180 degree turn. And then I was thinking about it this week. Did he, did he give it a 180 degree turn or did he just alter his course a bit from what he was doing once he came to the full truth and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yes, he would go from persecuting Christians to trying to make everyone a Christian. That seems like a total change in direction. He went from believing that the Old Testament law was the way to please God to putting his trust in Christ. So in that sense, yes, it was a very different direction. And he opposed Jesus like many Jews did, thought Jesus was the deceiver rather than the coming Messiah. And he believed that Jesus was opposed to God rather than being the Son of God. 
But I think in a lot of ways, it wasn't like he was necessarily living in gross sin and far from God. He just didn't have a good understanding of who God was and Jesus. And so it's just something to think about as we think about Paul and his work here at Ephesus. Like I, like I mentioned earlier, why was Paul writing this letter to the church? Let's turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto then, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitudes, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which would dwell in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and and Greeks. So I have a map here. And now I forget how to do the red dot again. Anyway, if you look in the center here, you see an Asia, uh, area called Asia. If you look down to the left a little bit is Ephesus. So Paul had went from Corinth, which was over on the, the uh, peninsula where Greece is, what was called Macedonia and Achaia there. Paul traveled either, most likely across the sea to Ephesus there. And as we look at this study this morning, we're going to see why some of the things that we're going to read here in, in Acts chapter 19 and also in Ephesians, how it was possible of what was going on at that time. And keep in mind as we go through this study this morning, often when we think of Asia, we think of what is India and China and that today. But this is when it talks about Asia here in the New Testament. It's speaking of Asia Minor, which is the area that today is Turkey, north of Syria, then over to where Ephesus is. Modern day Turkey is Asia. So as Paul preached here in Ephesus, why was it possible, it says that all of, let me see it here again, all they, verse 10, all they which dwell in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. According to the online Britannica Encyclopedia, quote, Ephesus commanded the west end of the one great trade route in Asia that along the Castor Valley and had easy access to the other two along the Hermas and meander rivers. And so it was a trade route, not only for ships coming in through the Aegean Sea, but also there was all kinds of trade routes over land that went through Ephesus. And so God put Paul at a prime spot to preach and to teach. The fascinating thing is, as I, as I looked into here, I'm sure I've heard a lot of this before, I just stuck out afresh to me. The fact that from the time of John the Baptist until Paul showed up, it looked like there were only, as far as we know, 12 believers who had repented, who were seeking the truth, but yet had not heard of the full gospel, had not heard of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. It sounds like they were willing to learn, they were open but until Paul came, they were not aware of what was going on. 
For a while, Paul preached in the synagogue, it said, for three months. But then they started getting opposition there, and so he moved the disciples and those that had come to believe to another location so that they could continue to teach and to disciple, even though the, uh, the, there were those that opposed them, they were able to remove themselves a bit and continue on the work. I'm going to show a few different pictures this morning as I'm preaching of the ruins of Ephesus. Today you can go there and still see much of where the city laid out. Obviously a lot of it's been destroyed either through earthquakes, natural things, and just time. But much of it still, you can see the size of the city. It was a large city. And yet out of that, when Paul came, there were only 12, we call believers, that knew some knowledge of God. Beyond, there were also Jewish people that lived there. But then there were many people, as we see here going on in Acts 19, there are many people who did not believe in God. Verse 11 this would be another view of the city there, the one of the main streets. There would have been buildings all along this stretch here. Let's pick up at verse 11 of Acts 19. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, of Jew, and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon them, overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all of the men, and counted the price of them, and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. At each turn... It's amazing how God continued to use each event, even though it may seem like Satan was getting the upper hand. He found people that opposed them. They moved out of the synagogue. And here, now we have a story of these Jewish people that were used to being able to call out evil spirits. And they obviously saw the work of Paul and the other disciples here, other believers here in Ephesus, and were amazed at how they could call out evil spirits in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul. So they thought we'd try it. But in this well-known story, they were overcome by the evil spirit and ran out of the house. You would have thought that could have also hampered the work, but rather people had greater respect for Paul and the other believers and many of them came to fear and to honor and worship Jesus because of this happening. Another amazing story here is that from this story, so many people were amazed and were drawn to the gospel that they came together and destroyed their works of witchcraft, their paraphernalia from all their demonic worship, and in trying to figure out how much this was worth, 50,000 pieces of silver, thinking that Jesus was portrayed for 30 pieces, how much was 50,000 pieces? And somewhere between 5 million is the lowball figure up to as much as 1 billion. So this was a tremendous, yes, it was a large city, but that was a tremendous sacrifice that these people made. It showed you that they were truly, were, changed and sorry for what they were doing and at least partially gave up what they had been doing we hope that many of them gave that up and actually became believers let's continue then with uh, verse 21 and after these things were ended paul purposed in the spirit 
when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. Now these are future things that he's talking about. He's still in Ephesus at this time. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And the same time there arose no small stir among that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain under the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they be no gods which may, are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship, worshipeth. And when they had heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and crying out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, and the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain men of Asia, were, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly were confused, and the more part knew not what, wherefore they had come together. Meaning that some of them went into the... There was a lot of excitement and a lot of uproar, and they went into the theater, and then there were a lot of that were just carried along with the, with the, with the riot, with the chaos. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with, with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is that there that knoweth not how the city of Ephesus is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches nor blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them plead one another. But if ye require anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For ye are in danger to be called into question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Here's a, a portrayal of what the temple potentially looked like. This is the size of the ruins, but it, the building is no longer standing today. But this event of the 50,000 pieces of silver worth of demonic paraphernalia so scared the businessmen of Ephesus that they got this crowd all up in arms. Paul, it says, wanted to go in there and defend the faith, but his companions knew that that was going to be a dangerous thing and convinced him not to. And in the end, God worked it out that no one, it doesn't appear that anyone died that day, even though it could have easily happened with the anger of that crowd. Here's a, there's, if you go on online, there are many, many pictures of this theater, but it is huge. This image doesn't quite capture, but it goes way up, and then behind it is the large hills. Just inside the theater, it could have sat as many as 25,000. So we don't know if it was a fourth full, half full, or all full, but if you had that thing full and they were yelling, like it said here, for two hours, or shouting for two hours, I'm sure the whole city would have heard about it. And that's why in the end, someone with some sense stood up and said, you know, we, we need to be careful or we're going to get in trouble for making such a stir. But God continued to use these things to continue to spread His name 
through Ephesus and through all the whole region. Now I want to go to Ephesians, back to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll continue looking there. This part so far um, is just to help us understand who the Ephesians were. It was a very well-to-do city. Um, they, they say that there was the shoreline at Ephesus was about a mile out from the city, where you saw there the theater and the streets. And they had a channel dug to get ships in and out. But what would happen is the river would flood and bring silt down, and it would keep pushing the shoreline farther and farther away from the city. But during Paul's day, during the Roman times, they would keep a channel clear so they could get ships in and out. But it was a very prosperous city. They had all this trade, business going on. They had all the people coming that were wanted to worship the goddess Diana. But God was using this wealthy, important hub as a way to also spread the gospel. And then Paul now has left, and a lot of time has passed, and he's writing, as we look here in the next few months, as we look at the book of Ephesians, he's writing back to, to, to challenge them, to encourage them. And so that's where we pick up here. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted and in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his graces, of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom also ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also ye believed, ye were sealed that with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory." Thinking back to what we read in Acts chapter 19 when Paul told them the, the full gospel of Jesus Christ and then baptized them in the name of Jesus and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Here there in verses 13 and 14, especially 13, he references back to that. It's just interesting to see that after all this time had passed, he still wanted them to not forget how their story began, how the work of Christ in Ephesus began. But as we look at this passage here, verses 3 through 14, as a group, uh, it, could be, it could be controversial for some people. Some people who struggle, struggle with understanding the idea of us being predestinated to be believers. What does that mean? And some people take it to the place of of Five points of Calvinism. And I'm not going to go into all that this morning, but I want us to remind us that predestinated, when we understand who God is and His sovereignty, it can help us to understand this idea of being predestinated, but yet still being creatures of choice. To understand that God knew each one of us were going to be here today. We're going to be alive on the earth when we are. He knew exactly what our experiences would be growing up, who our parents would be, who we would marry or not marry, who we would come in contact with. God knew all those things before the earth was even created. And that at times is hard in our human limited thinking to think about 
How could God know those things? And yet, we still have choice daily, a choice to do right or wrong. And yet, that's how that God can say that we are predestinated to be a part of His church, part of His family. But yet, we still have our own human choice to whether we're, what path we're going to take. I'd like to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just some verses, I believe, go along well with Ephesians 1 here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'm going to read 1 through 16. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. But if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast obtained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For godliness exercise, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is now is and that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all exception. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word and conversation, in character, sorry, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon all these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So as we think of this predestination, and some people saying, well, that means that we can't lose your faith, you lose your salvation if you have it. It's quite clear, Paul teaching here in 1 Timothy, that there are those who will depart. There are those who will know the truth and then make the choice to depart from it. And it gives a lot of reasons why here and also ways to avoid that. It, Paul challenges us here to give attendance to readings or exhortation to doctrine, to not go and neglect the gift that's within us and to meditate and to take heed. All these things are important. Yes, no one can take away our salvation except ourselves through our own choices. So we need to be careful. First Thess Second Thessalonians 2, 3. You don't have to turn there. But I'm going to read, If let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there become a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Turn with me now to First Timothy chapter 1. I want to read three verses there. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So once again, how is it possible to shipwreck or to fall away if you were never saved. I believe these men had been saved and then chose to fall away. Another one is in 2 Timothy 4.10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is parted unto Thessalonica. So another man who had been serving with Paul, who sadly fell away. God's love is not irresistible. 
If we make choices, if we make choices that are against God's will, we will come to a point where our names will be removed from the book of life. This doesn't mean that we can't regain that salvation, but it's not something that we should take lightly or to think that there's nothing we can do to keep or to get it. I do, in closing, as I look here in the last um, section here in Ephesians, um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to read it all this morning, but in 1 John chapter 5, there's a lot of good <clears throat> information here and when it comes to our salvation and how to know if we're saved. I'm sure there are some of you this morning that struggle with assurance of salvation. And this is something that, can, that Satan can use when you think of this predestination and what does it mean to be saved or how do we stay saved and all that. Verse 1 of chapter 5, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth Him that begat, loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, and we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And I'm going to stop there. But I challenge you, if you struggle with assurance of salvation, study these five chapters of First John. The, the, the biggest part of our salvation is the work of God, the, the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, His resurrection power then to keep us and to save us. But our part, there's also a part that we are involved with in salvation, and that is choosing to accept the gift and then following God's command. I want to read a couple more passages quickly. Ephesians, turn with me to, back to Ephesians. Back to Ephesians 1. I want to finish reading chapter 1. Picking up verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, what is the riches of glory in His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward usward, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The verses 15 and 16, we see Paul's love and devotion that still remained for the church at Ephesus, even though he had been gone for a while. And I think he would later stop in, I think before this writing here, he would stop in again and visit the church in Ephesus to encourage them. But even while he was suffering and in prison and struggling, his, he still loved and cared for them. He still prayed for them. And that's just encouraging to see that he had not forgotten them. He had not, even with all the other areas, churches he had served and started, he still had a love for them. And then the last verses here of chapter 1, he's challenging them not to forget that... Christ needs to be preeminent in their lives and in the church. I don't know what the church of Ephesus was all struggling with, but he obviously wanted them to be careful not to forget the importance of Jesus Christ. When people start to fall away from the faith, not even just, I mean, you say you can look at false churches, cults and such, they often replace Christ with something else. 
they put Christ down on a lower level than being a part of the Godhead, than being the Son of God, which then allows them to believe things that are not true. And so we need to be careful that we do the same, that we keep Christ in His proper place. That we keep in mind that, yes, spiritually speaking, the church is the body of Christ, and Christ, but Christ is the head. And we can't separate those things. We can't have a body, we can't have a church that is following God and yet separated from Christ. Those things go together. In closing, I want to read a few verses here from 1 Colossians chapter 1. Sorry, not 1 Colossians, from Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Let us work as a church, as believers this morning to always make Christ first in our lives and especially in the church. The Lord bless each one of you.